fly fishing. The casting of an artificial fly to a trout in the hope of fooling one of the wiliest species in the United Kingdom. Clever techniques needed for clever fish. And for the beginner wanting to try this particular sport, it can be the most daunting. It's all about accuracy, control, timing and camouflage. Fly rods, fly reels, leaders, sinking lines, floating lines, a myriad of lures from buzzers to nymphs, from terrestrials to humongous, from hare's ears to the inspirationally named boobies. It could all get a bit complicated, but today we have the answer in bringing to the small screen the talented teaching skills of ex-UK international and manager Simon Gorsworth, European champion Ian Barr. Both these guys not only fish well, they guide well. I have no doubt that after watching this programme, you'll have a much easier time learning how to fly fish on still waters. So, without further ado, let's join Simon at Blakewell Fishery, a premier water in North Devon. Hopefully, he's cracking into the first fish of the day. He's gonna go. I don't know if he knows he's okay. There he goes, there he goes. That's more like it, and he's off. Keep your rod high, never panic when you're playing a fish. It's too easy when you hook the first few trout to try and rush the thing to get the fish in, but anytime he wants to run, just let him go. And then bring him back in again. And it's just a battle of wheels. And we've got to be careful here, we've got some weeds, so I'm just doing a little bit of side strain, left hand side strain, turning the fish out see the fish swimming out to the middle of the lake now, away from the close bank. I don't want to get him into the bank. Well caught in the weeds if we do that. So just... I've got him in control now. Here he is. And at this early stage, very important to get your net ready so you've got the first opportunity to net him. He's yours. Crouch low. Don't let the fish see you. They don't like coming into shallow water and they certainly don't like seeing anglers. So you always crouch low when you're playing with Apply a little bit more side strain here. He's coming into the weeds, but don't panic, don't jump up and, because you'll, the sudden movement will spook him. You'll just turn out to the middle with some side, side strain like that. There he is. In fact, there's another one following. And see what he goes. Woo! He's off. Look at that. He doesn't like that shallow water. Never like shallow water. There he comes. Coming to the surface a bit now, and that's what we want to see. It's a sign of the fish getting tired. Now, for the first time, he's going to the left, so you apply a little bit of right hand side strain. Gradually, gradually. Oh, he's off again. Doesn't like that shallow water. And there's a little bit of a battle here. Who's going to fire out first, me or the fish? Hopefully, the fish. <laughs> if he's a big one, usually me. And we bring it in, and the other mistake which beginners tend to make is trying to wind the fish right up to the rod. Keep outside about a rod length of leader here. I've got about a nine foot of leader on here, and uh, I'm not going to wind it any nearer than that. That's easily close enough for me to net. Once that fish is tired, it's easily close enough for me to net. And again, don't rush. That's the biggest thing to remember when playing a fish. Never rush. The fish is boss until he's tired. There he comes. He's starting to play around on the surface now. And that's a good sign. He must almost be ready. Usually when I say that, they shoot off. Keep the net underwater, hidden. That's it. And then what you're trying to do is lift his head up out of the water and then just glide him straight over the net mesh. There's his head. Now is he going to No, he's turned. He saw me. I don't like seeing people. Here he comes. No, he's... Giving a good old account for himself, this little chap. He's not too bad, I'd say about two pound, two pound four. Nice rainbow trout. Hopefully we can get ourselves a little brown trout later on and you can see the difference. Okay, keep his head up, 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 and he's in. And we swing him ashore. And that's what nymphing's all about. Catching trout like that, light tackle, wonderful. And the key here is to quickly and instantly hit the fish on the head. Don't let him suffer, and straight away you 
caught a trout, and the first trout of the day on the nymph. Absolute brilliant fishing nymphing, absolute brilliant. All right, we've got him in, dispatched it, need to unhook it. Hook right in the scissors, just where you should get all your fish, never down the throat, unhook it. And this is a rainbow trout. Let's have a look at the markings on it. Typical rainbow trout, nice purple sheen, freckles rather than spots. We'll see, hopefully we'll see a brown trout later on, and brown trout got round spots rather than freckles and a golden flank. But this is a beautiful condition of rainbow. If you ever need to have a look at your rainbow, pick it up and just hold him out, and that's how you take a picture. And that is what fly fishing is all about, catching this. What a wonderful start. Quite simply, you have many items of tackle. You have a reel and a rod, obviously. Fly line, which comes in various densities. And we'll talk about fly line and the types of fly line later on. You have backing. And again, I'll talk about backing in a moment, but I'd just like you to see what type of materials we come across. And you have a selection of flies to catch fish. And that is the most important thing, the choice of fly according to what the fish are like. Right, let's have a look at how you put the tackle together. Here we have a fly reel. This is the Daiwa Altmore fly reel. Top quality fly reel this. And I'm just gonna show you how to put the backing, which is the very first thing you should put on your reel, onto the reel. Now, there's many types of backing in the fishing world, and perhaps one of the best ones is called braided monofill. Braided monofill is made of individual strands of monofill braided together to create a hollow but thick, strong rope. Now, for something I'm gonna show you later on, and the reason I would like to dwell on later is before you actually start putting the backing on, cut off about two foot of this braid and put that aside. And you'll see why later on. And this is before you even put the backing on, cut the braid off. Now, there's one or two very, very important tips with putting backing to the reel. And the first thing I think you should know is that to prevent the reel and line slipping, you should tie in the very end of your braid an ordinary overhand knot. Just one of those. Pull it fairly tight and lock it. Snip off the stub. And what I'm actually going to do is tie a slip knot around the actual reel itself and the, the granny knot in the end of the monofill stops the slip knot sliding. So you poke the line around the reel and just a very simple knot where you just twist the line around the main stem like this and tuck the short end back through once and twice and pull tight. And what you're left with, if you've done it correctly, I'll just slide this knot to the end, like that. Lock the granny knot locks against the knot, and you just slide this down, and it should tighten nicely around the reel. And I think the biggest tip here, certainly for beginners taking this up and putting the first backing onto the reel, this won't work, so I'll just show you why. If you just start to wind this in, see all that happens is that the backing will slide around the reel and not wind itself in. And many, many times I've come across people, anglers who fish for 10 years, five years, or beginners who haven't attached the backing in the right way. And what will happen is the line slides around like that even when you've got the entire backing and fly line on. So really essential tip when you attach the backing to the reel with a knot, I put a small drop of super glue Leave that dry for a second. And the super glue will set and stop the backing spinning around the reel. So when you wind the line on, it's gonna get a firm grip, it's gonna attach itself to the reel. You're not gonna be worried later on about the entire line slipping within itself. We leave that to dry. Got to wind the backing onto the reel now. And it's very important that you connect the backing to a form of spool holder like this. This is what we call a green dragon. It doesn't matter if you use a green dragon or you can use a biro pen and put the biro between your knees and wind it on like that. This is very useful for me. I put a lot of backing onto the reels, so I buy a green dragon. And the green dragon goes onto the very end of the rod. And then I put the reel on the bottom end of the rod to wind it in. 
And again, if you haven't got a green dragon, don't worry about it. You put a biro between your knees and the backing goes on the biro between your knees and you just wind it similar to what I'm doing now, but the difference is the backing is on the ring. You wind this backing very steadily and it's very important that as you wind the backing in, you do two things. First of all, you keep the line tight between your left index and middle finger and this is if your right hand wind and that keeps a bit of tension between the reel and the fingers so the, line, the backing doesn't go on slack and secondly let me get a good shot of that but I wind the backing back and forth across this reel covering from one side to the other and what that does is lays the backing on a nice even smooth build up and I'm not going to build up a great lump in the middle which is going to cause problems later on. Once the backing's on, we have to put on the fly line. And when you buy your fly line, it comes in a plastic packet like this, plastic container. Uh, there's a sticky label inside. Take that out, put it aside. It tells you what your line is. So we're later on, once you've put the fly line on and you go fishing for six or eight months and you're not too sure what fly line you've got, the sticky label should be on your reel showing you what it is. You then cut off your little black tags. Careful not to cut the fly line when you do that. And find one end of the line and pull it out, put the spool together and just twist it to lock it. That's this type of fly line. This is a Cortland fly line and Cortland work on this plastic principle. Other companies have other things. You've now got to attach the two together. And this is a fairly simple process. There's one or two ways. One of them is using glue. The preferred way, the way I prefer, is to use sleeves. These are plastic sleeves of assorted sizes. And what you do is snip open the packet and find a sleeve that is of suitable size. And you can see there's different color sleeves in here. It doesn't really matter what color. They're all different size. Get one out. And there are different sizes because you get different thicknesses of fly line. The heavier your fly line is, the thicker it's going to be. So when you get a sleeve, test the sleeve size first by inserting the fly line into the sleeve and giving it a little bit of a shake. And if it drops off like that, the sleeve is too big. And that sleeve is designed for a fatter fly line. So we try another sleeve. That's a tighter fit, so that one could be it. Put that on, put the fly line. Oop, no, that dropped straight off. So again, that's too wide a sleeve. And you keep going until you find the right size sleeve for the fly line. That's more like it. Now that one didn't fall off, so we've got the right size sleeve there. It doesn't want to be really tight. It wants to be just fairly friction, a little bit of friction there, but loose enough so that the line will slide in and out and tight enough so it doesn't fly off when you give it a wiggle. Having found the sleeve, snip off about half an inch and put the sleeve onto the braided backing. It's just like threading a needle, careful how you do it, and pop the sleeve straight over the braided backing you've got here. And slide the sleeve right out of the way. It's got, at the moment, it's got nothing to do with what we're going to do here. Come back to the fly line, pick up the fly line, and remember I was saying earlier on that the braid is hollow. So what you want to do is insert the fly line up the middle of the braid. Okay, it's a little bit slow to start with, and what happens is the braid will start to fray. Don't worry, keep going, just pushing the fly line, working the fly line down the braid, and you'll find at one stage it will just start to bite there. Well, it's bitten. And this is rather like threading pyjama elastic around your pyjamas, where you just work the fly line down the braid until you've covered about an inch and a half. About an inch and a half of fly line is going to be sufficient a grip on this. It's a slow old process. It's what we call slugging. It's just a little bit of feeding the backing up the fly line until, as I say, there's perhaps an inch and a half there. About that much. 
In its own right, this is a very, very strong grip. You don't have to worry about it. See, if I, the harder I pull this, the harder it grips because it works on a, a principle like a Chinese sort of finger torture principle where you put on a sleeve. The tighter you pull, the thinner it contracts and the tighter it grips. So it won't come off like that. But because it's a braided material, it can quite easily fray undone. And that's the purpose of this sleeve. You slide the sleeve up onto the fly line and just work the fly line down the sleeve until the sleeve is right up to the tips of the fray. And once it gets to the tips of the fray, that's far enough. It should be a tight fit. You don't want the sleeve to fly off on one cast. And this is why we tested the sleeve to start off with. Too tight a fit and you wouldn't be able to get it on. So I'm just going to hook my nails in here, give it a little bit of a pull. That's tight. I've just taken it to the fray. When you get to the fray, get rid of these little stubs. Just snip off the frayed bits. And then finally you're going to slide the sleeve that tiny sixteenth of an inch just to cover the ends so they're totally covered. Like that. Got the fly line down the middle of the braid, plastic sleeve slid up to the frayed ends, stops the thing fraying. Very good, firm, solid attachment. Have to wind it on, take a biro, something like that, slip it on the spool of the line, and again, your knees are the easiest, you won't be able to see this, but the knees are the easiest. I just put the biro between my knees, and just like I was doing with the backing, wind the fly line on. Again, weaving the fly line back to and fro across the line until the reel is entirely full of fly line. That's your basic kit set up. We come on to this piece of braid I mentioned earlier on. Bring this back into the picture. This two foot length you chopped off your backing before you put it on the reel. Somehow you have got to have an intermediate bit between your fly line and what's called the leader. And the leader is your front piece of line that you attach your hook to. And the simplest connector between the two is a thing called a butt, B-U-T-T, -T, butt. And you have to put these two together. But first, make your butt. Very easy. Take a needle. Large eye, long needle, perhaps two inches long. Quite a thick eye. And the butt is made by, first of all, threading the braid through the eye of the needle. Hence the need for a large eyed needle. And I pull through about a quarter of an inch, half an inch, something like that. Then lay the needle along the braid, insert the needle very carefully into the middle of the braid, being hollow, it'll go in, and feed the braid up the needle steadily. What you don't want is the braid to burst while the needle pops out the side, so just very carefully feed the braid up the needle until the needle's fully covered. Careful to leave a half inch stub, you Pull the braid down till the needle bursts itself through and then holding the bare needle, feed the braid up towards the eye of the needle, just pushing the braid up the eye of the needle. You then have to twizzle and roll the braid, and this is the tricky bit, until the needle disappears within the braid itself and you start to get a loop. And this is what you're actually going to finish up with, a loop. Keep feeding the braid off the needle eye and again insert something like the end of a biro or anything into this loop because you don't want to lose the loop. The loop is what we're actually making. And keeping the biro in the loop, I just work the needle out and off. And the needle has nothing to do with it anymore, put that aside. Bring back the loop you've made and just brush out any slack you get into the line. Just a smooth brush like that. Take out the biro bit and you see what I've got in the front end of my braid is a small tight loop and it's that that we're trying to make, this is the butt. It's a little bit small so you enlarge the loop just by unpulling just a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch at a time until the loop is about the size of a small piece of sweet corn. And that is the braided loop you've made. You have to once again, come back to this magical stuff, this super glue, and squirt a single drip of super glue 
just about a quarter of an inch from the V of the loop, just about there. Just a drip and the super glue will set and it will hold the loop and the loop will neither be able to get larger or smaller, it will be fixed at that size. Cut the fly line, uh, this backing stuff, and what you need to do is find the double bit. There's a double bit here where the braid has gone down itself to about here, and this is what we call the double bit. You come down about two and a half to three inches from there along the single and snip the thing you've just made off. And there's a bit more braid here to make some spare butts. And that is the final result. This is what you're actually trying to make. A short piece of line with a loop in one end and about three inches of hollow braid on the other end. You've got to attach it to the fly line now. Pick up the sleeve, and this is the same process as you did with the backing to the fly line. The sleeve is cut to about half an inch long. It's the same size. I've tested it on my fly line to make sure it's the same size. And once again, insert the braid into the sleeve. So the sleeve is now mounted onto the braid. Slide the sleeve up the braid, up onto the double bit, and exactly as before, insert the fly line into the braid, and as before, work the fly line down the backing until it reaches the double bit, the stoppage point. I'll just get it going, there we go. And then back to this slugging, working it down. It's very important at this stage that you make sure that the fly line is worked all the way down the braid and until it meets the doubled end, the thick end here where the braid is formed to make the loop. If you don't go that far, you'll get a very limp hinge in effect. And when you're trying to cast the thing, it won't turn over. So just work away, just working this thing down. Exactly the same as we did earlier. The difference being you have a definite stopping point, which I'll show you in a moment. And the stopping point is there. It can't go any further down because the double bit of braid will stop it. So I've reached the final stage of that. And as before, grab your sleeve and slide the sleeve up the fly line. Again, just use your nails if you can. Up to the frayed ends. Tight fit. And snip off all these frayed ends. And then the final stage with this is again to slide that sleeve up just to cover the stubs. Just. And this butt is going to stay on your fly line now for as long a period as you like, perhaps two or three years. You don't need to do this more than once every two or three years. It's stuck on there, it's going to stay on there, and it's from this stage onwards that you will change your leader daily. The next knot or two I'm going to show you, you'll see how you attach the leader on, but that is your final setup. That is your basic tackle kit setup. You now put on your leader, tie on your fly, and you're ready to go fishing. There's a right way and a wrong way to undo the leader. The right way, Keep your thumb and index finger into the loop of leaders you've found here. And have a look at the, try and find an end. There's two ends, there's a thick end and a thin end. And if I just pull this one out for a second, you'll see that this end is very, very thick indeed. It's about, I guess, 20, 25 pound of breaking strain of monofilm. Very, very thick end. And you slowly unravel the leader. It's twisted around itself perhaps six or seven times until you've got rid of the twists in it. And then keeping it on finger and thumb, just unwind, you see it's springing off there, keeping the tension on it, and it gets thinner and thinner until the very front of the leader is almost impossible to see. It's 3.4 pounds, very, very thin monofill, and that is why it's a knotless taper. If I just draw it through my fingers, you'll see the leader gets thicker very steadily, thicker until you get to the real thick back end of the leader. There's no knots in it and the beauty of this type of leader is it's very, very easy to cast and turn over so it avoids tangles. To attach the leader to the fly line, very, very simple. You tie what we call a double overhand loop knot. And what I'm doing is 
finding about eight inches of leader at the thick end, that's the important end, folding it in half, pulling tight, and then you just twist and form what I call a granny knot. Others have different names, but just form a granny knot like that. But hence the name double overhand loop. You just tuck the loop through a second time. Okay, pull tight, very steadily. And one of the most important tips of pulling any knot tight in monofill is you should lick the monofill when you tighten. So give that a good moistening and pull tight. And the reason for the lick is that monofill is prone to burning through friction and the burning through friction will weaken the monofill and, enable, and make it snap. So you lick it to avoid the, the friction burning the monofill. Cut off the stub of this loop. Nice and flush, you don't want to get any ends to create tangles. And then it's a simple matter of looping the two loops together. The loop which I showed you earlier on, the butt which I've put on the fly line, and the loop of the leader you've just tied. There's a very easy way to remember this, and I like to think of ABBA, the singing group, and the simplest way to remember this is to remember ABBA. You have two loops, one is A and one is B. And A is the loop that is attached to the fly line. A for attached, B is the bit. And quite simply, ABBA is spelled A, B, B, A. So you take A into B, and then you take the end of B, wherever the end of your leader is, and poke it into A. And then just pull through the leader until the knot forms that. Like a reef knot effect. That's a good, strong, very simple join. And the beauty of this, other than any other form of join to leader, is that when I want to change the leader, I quite simply push the two together and I'll pull out the old leader to thread in a new leader as and when I want a new leader. So it's a good, simple, fast knot, very strong and very reliable. You then wind it all on and you are now set to go fishing. There's plenty of fish rising on the lake. In fact, in fact the fish haven't stopped rising and you cannot turn down an opportunity like that. When fish are coming up to the surface, you have to really try a dry fly. So we'll have the nymph off, and one of the most useful techniques when dry fly fishing is uh, what we call the suspended buzzer, and that's the type of dry fly I'm gonna start off with. So we'll take the nymph off. And this is the box of dries, and as you can see, they range in a variety of colours, I'll stick the nymph in there for the time being, they range in a variety of colours and, and sizes. And you've got to really think of what the fish are feeding on, and I think the fish are going to be feeding on something like this. This is an elk hair emerger. It's black, black is the predominant colour of stillwater fish, they feed on black more than anything else. So we're going to tie a black fly on to start with. And you've got a couple of important rules to remember with dry fly fishing. Very, very important rule is that when the fish come up to take your dry fly, they do so hoping that it's a natural, looking to be a natural. And there's no way in the world your fly will look to be natural if the lead is floating. So the very, very important rule, and this is where most beginners unfortunately go wrong, is that you coat the leader in a sinking compound to make it sink. Now, first of all, the dry fly must float. So the dry fly is dunked into this chemical. This is just a, a waterproofing agent on the fly. It keeps the fly dry and keeps it floating upright. And then, as I say, the most, I think one of the most important tips of dry fly fishing is that we coat the leader in this sinking compound. It's easily done and commonly done with a wet fly, but very few anglers use this stuff on the dry fly, and it's perhaps more important with the dry than anything else. And as before, we wet the leader, about three foot of it, apply this sinking compound. It's just a degreasing agent, really. The only reason the leader floats is because the leader's greasy. So we put on a degreaser, 
and then wash it off. And that's the dry setup. And the technique, well, we'll show you the technique. But first, I think we should go over to the corner there. There's a few fish rising in that corner and we'll give it a go. Let's see how successful the dry fly is. Right, here we are. As before, get your net ready, put it down by the side, ready for action. You don't want to be searching for your net when you've got a fish on. With the dry fly, having dunked it in that floatant, the feathers are still wet, obviously the floatants are liquid, so you must dry the fly off with just some short, sharp casting, drying off the feathers. Right, it's about 10 or 12 casts. And then pop the fly down, check it floats, and cast it out. And remember the dry fly is floating. It's used to good effect when you cover rising fish. So really the most important rule with a dry fly fisherman is you aim for a trout. We'll put it out there first. There's nothing rising particularly. And you leave it there. And what you're trying to do with a dry fly, it's trying to represent a natural. So if you think of how a natural fly is going to be moving on the water, it's just going to blow around in the wind. And to that effect, you keep the line with a little bit of slack in it. You see, I've got, I haven't retrieved all the slack in the line. I keep a little bit of slack. The fly's going to drift around as per the wind. And in fact, here we don't have any wind, so the fly's just going to sit there, which makes the dry fly a little bit awkward. But the most important thing is observation. You, whilst you look at your dry, you keep your eye on the water and see if we can see a fish rise. And remember what I was saying earlier on, the fish swim upwind. So when you see a fish rise, just put your fly upwind of the fish and he should come onto it. And there's one over there. We'll just put the fly in that direction. It's possibly out of range, but we'll put one in that direction in case he's swimming this way. And the fly is usually left static. You don't normally work your dry fly through the water. Though, if you get any interest in the fly and the fish perhaps refuse it, there's another fish a bit further. Now that's more like it. Now that's where, now we should expect a fish there. It's pretty close to that feeding fish. He might come up to that. You can't see him at the moment. He's possibly gone off the other direction. That's a shame. Oh, there he is. You see, boiled right underneath the fly. He didn't take it, but the boil's underneath. And that's a good indication. There's something not quite right about that. Oh, he took it. Ah, oh, too fast to strike on that one. That's an apprehension. That's a typical problem with dry flies. With a dry fly, you delay your strike. Never strike instantly with a dry. There's a fish there. That's better. That's it. That was a slower strike. And you see what happens when you cover a rise. I could see the fish in the water and he came straight up for it. And I saw which direction it's, that fish was swimming. Now, unfortunately, he's not running anywhere at the moment. And when fish don't do anything, you have to pull him by hand until you can get the slack out. So come on fish, pull off that slack. I want to get him onto the reel as soon as possible. This is going to get caught around the other one. He's doing a little bit now. There he goes. There he goes. That's better. On the reel. I feel much happier when he's on the reel. There's no way I can get entangled and stand on the line. Now, he hasn't even got into first gear yet. There he goes. Oh, uh, whew, look at that one go. Now he thinks, now he knows he's hooked. There he comes, he's coming back on the surface. And again, he's, he's doing everything. In fact, he's playing the fish himself. Yeah, he's not doing, I don't have to do anything. He's not going into weed or anything like that. He's just running off. And remember, always let that fish run. Oh, look at them go. Get on, go on a bit further. There yeah. he comes, he's come up to the top again. Short bursts of runs like that means that he's going to tie himself up much quicker that way, which is fine by me. And a very high rod, note how high this rod is. It's so important when you're playing fish that you keep your rod tip up. Now he's come to shallow water again, he's not going to like that. He'll be off again any second now. There we go. I do not like shallow water. Now let's see if I can just turn him around into a situation where we're going to be able to net it. And he's staying on my left at the moment. Let's just turn him round to the right here. And again, as before, crouch down. Don't let him see you. There he comes. Another rainbow. 
Most don't like that shallow water. Look at him go. Wow. What beauties. Okay, he's coming in again. Now, I don't want him to get too near that weed, so I'll put a bit of side strain on it here. Now, he's coming to shallow. Will he see me? I bet he will. And he looks like he's hooked right in the scissors, which is just perfect. Fine by me. Oop, chuck the head in. Net in position. Keep low. Like he's coming up to the top a lot quicker than the other fish, so he's he's tiring. But never make the mistake of thinking that he's tired. He's, he could just scoot off at any second and tear off he will. If he sees me. As soon as he gets that shallow water. There he goes. Don't like that shallow water. Come on, in you come. Keeping that rod high. Going towards some weed there, so we need to slowly turn him back to the centre. Nice flat rod, very steady pull when you've got this side string. Don't force the fish, see how easy he comes, just like a dog on a lead. That's it, turned him. He's exactly where I want him, now right in front of me. And if he goes to the right of the net, I turn him left, bring him back towards the net. And if he tries going left of the net, you bring him to the right. That's it, his head's coming up a bit now, so he's Firing out. And he's going right again. He's certainly trying hard this fish, but I think he must have exhausted himself with those two beautiful runs. He absolutely tore across the lake just now. And obviously that's going to play on the fish. So he's not, hopefully, got the strength for any more big runs. There he's going after the left, so we turn him gently to the right. As before, do not bring that fish in too near. The great temptation is to wind that line in. I know I said that earlier, but it's such an important tip for beginners to not wind in more. I see I've got a, at least a foot and a half of fly line outside the rod and the whole leader. Here it comes. Don't let him see the net. Keep the net still. And here we go. Oh, oh that's a better fish. That's another fish just like the other one. A bit fatter, maybe another ounce bigger than that last one. And as before, out with the priest and really Pop him on the head before he's got a chance to suffer. A couple of hard blows, and that's another rainbow. And that one was on the dry, and you can see the fun of the dry fly. Is you, everything is active. You see the fish, you cover the fish, and if luck goes with you, he comes up, takes the fish, and you end up with a beautiful trout like this. Look at that beauty. And I'll unhook that in a moment. And uh, in fact, he's unhooked himself. Look at that. He spat the hook out as he came into the net. So, what more could you ask? All right, the dry fly's out there again. We've just put it out to see if there's any fish rising around this area. And really, you're looking for a rising fish. You've got to cover rising fish with dry flies. Fish are feeding on the surface. There's no point in you just fishing blind like this. Wait for a fish to rise. But leave the fly out there where the fish are just in case something pops its head up and takes your fly. Although, as I say, it's much better to actually take, there's a fish, there's a rise there. Now let's pick the fly. We can just pop, pop it down in the area of that fish. There he is. Now he's turned, you can see him, he's coming up. Is he going to come up? Oh, he's just underneath it. I can see him. He's, having, he's coming back for a second look. No, no, he's gone away. He didn't like something about that fly. Oh, is that him? No. He just bolted straight at that fly. I thought he was going to take it down in one, but he didn't turned away and I think the reason is the leader is still floating and he must have seen that leader and just turned, oh, there he is. Having said that, he came back. Okay, we've got him back on again. Let's get onto the reel as fast as possible. Get all that slack line out of the way. Nice high rod. And we're in action. There he goes. Now, is this one going to respond as all trout usually do? And when they get to shallow water, run and off he goes. Or is he just going to come straight into the net? I'm not doing it on this chap. Keep him away from that weed. Turn him round. Now let's have a look. 
remember, always get that net in position well in advance of you netting the fish, so the first opportunity you get to net it, you can land it. Keep his head out. And turn him away from trouble. He's, liked, he's really intent on getting on that weed. Come on, fish. Get away from that weed. Oh, that's, it. that's more like it. He's, like, he's off at last. He's decided he's hooked. That time he realised he's hooked, and he's into gear. Come away from there. And get you in that weed bed. A little bit of side strain. We should just very carefully ease him round to the front. Saw me again. That's more like it. Now we've got him in control. There's no weed beds out there. Now, if we can keep his head up, there he is. Head out the water, just draw him in, and Bob's your uncle. Now, that's the success of the dry fly. And as before, you've got to dispatch this fish fairly quickly. Don't even take him out of the net when you're dispatching the fish. The net's a good grip. It enables you to hold the fish. You don't drop the fish. It doesn't slip out your fingers. So hold the fish in the net when you're dispatching it. And please do dispatch your fish straight away. Don't leave it there suffering for a few minutes whilst you find your priest. And then as before, we'll unhook the fish and slip it in the fish bass. Most articles and books and magazines will tell you your fly should sit still. Sometimes try moving it. It did work then, and it will sometimes work again. Just remember, too hard a twitch, and you're going to sink the fly straight away. It's a brownie. Oh my goodness. That's a brownie. Coming up from the depths. Now this is a brownie, a beautiful brownie. This is more like it. Now, let's sh hopefully we can land this brownie and I'll show you what you're going to do. Now, personally, I have a rule. I don't like to keep brown trout. So if we can get this trout in, I'll show you how to return a fish. You can see him coming up from the depth. Keep him up. Don't mess any fish you're going to return. Wet your hand. Grab the leader. Put the rod down. No sudden movements. Gently pick up the fish. Ooh. And he's gone, he shook himself off anyway. That was a brown trout, and that's what I've been trying to catch all the time, a brown trout. And unfortunately, he shook himself off, but I'd like to have picked that up and just show you the difference between a brown trout and a rainbow trout. And remember that brown trout, I prefer to return brown trout, they're the natural wild fish of the waters. That one was a wild brownie, they don't stop brown trout in this lake, so he was gonna go back, he's gone back anyway. He's a happy little chap. He got off a bit before I could show you, but he's unharmed and he shot off. Thanks for that, Simon. Let's now go and find Ian Barr at Lynch's Lakes, Evesham. Well, here we are at this beautiful little lake, yet just one cast to produce this beautiful rainbow trout of approximately two pounds, taken on a very imitative dull-back nymph. Uh, here we go now, we're off to go and try and catch a second fish, maybe on the second cast, maybe not. We'll have to see how we get on. So here we go, onto the lake. I'm fishing with a midge tip line using three imitative nymph patterns. Now you may want to ask why I chose to fish three nymphs. Well, the lake is quite small, approximately three acres, and imitative patterns will always take the fish. They're very, very easily scared by big lures that are thrown out by other anglers. So I've gone for a natural approach, and let's see if it brings some just rewards. I've chose this end of the lake due to the, the sun being where it is. The fish are now coming away from the sun. It's also flat calm, there's plenty of fly life and insects about, but most importantly, there are trout fishing, swimming and feeding in around my range. And hopefully, I'll be able to attempt a, a few into my net. Let's see how we get on. An almost static retrieve, letting the flies descend through the depths, go through the fish's feeding layers, allow them plenty of time to observe, and hopefully, of all hope, snatch hold. Now and again I do a nice little steady retrieve. They call this the figure of eight because you simply make the figure eight with the line in your fingers. 
and this allows the nymphs to steadily move through the layers, enticing those lovely rainbow trout. Well, first cast was successful. Second cast seems to be an absolute failure. But there is that saying in fishing, third time lucky. So let's try the third cast, maybe go a little bit further. And what you notice I'm gonna do now is, I'm gonna cover a fresh piece of water. I've just put a nice line across that angle, caught nothing, so I'm gonna search the next few yards slightly to the right, and they call this fan casting. You just slowly cover the available water to you. So let's try one down the middle section of my, my little swim. Let's see how we do. Avoiding those very dangerous, inviting trees behind me. I've caught a few of those in my fair time, I have to confess. Okay, I'm now allowing the flies to slowly sink through the layers. What's important, here we are, fish, oh, he's gone. He is gone, and believe it or not, he may, may have snapped my line, which is extremely bad angling. It happens to the best of us, me included. Let's just check the cast. Well, confessions of an expert fly fisher. That fish has just snapped, very clean, eight and a half pound fluorocarbon line with very, very much ease. Very, very aggressive take. Bad angle on my part, I have to say, be my third cast, it wasn't so lucky. It was extremely unlucky. I hit that fish far too hard, and what you teach anglers, and I should teach myself, is to slowly lift into a fish, not do what I did, and give a very, very heavy strike, causing that line just to part. And unfortunately, we now have a fish with a hook trailing in its mouth, which is um, not very good. Okay, I'm now gonna set up a new leader and try again. I've just reset up my rig, uh, putting on the same three identical flies. That last fish just escaped with my uh, hare's ear pattern, which you can see here. This is a size 12 small hare's ear. Leading up to that, I have approximately six foot away, keeping the nymphs well separated. I have one of my favorite nymphs, which is worldwide known, which is the cruncher nymph, tied with pheasant tail. A very, very imitative, stylish pattern, which will catch fish all around the world, no problem. And again, six foot to my point fly, which this first fish, which we have seen, took was a, a redhead dial back. Now the little redhead is very, very fluorescent in that water and this draws the trout in and allows them to see it from quite a big distance. It draws them in and they just took this fly in as a very tidy morsel. Okay, I've just lost that fish. I'm now gonna work my way back out to the water and try for my fourth cast and my third fish. Let's see how we do. The water's had plenty of time to rest. It's had about 10 minutes while I've tackled up. So let's see, here we are around my feet. This is what not to do. Bit of dancing around your line, should do. Right, let's try and uh, catch another fish. Here we go. Okay, so I've just covered this bit of water now. I'm gonna work my way across and try and cover a new section of water for trout that has yet to see my flies on my line. See how we get on. Okay, that last fish managed to break my line because my rod tip angle was far, far too close to the water. Fishing it two or three foot above the water like this gives you a nice big spring. When the fish takes, you will see the line at the end of the rod tip lift like that, and that is your indicator to, to lift into the fish, and not what I did in the last one with a very heavy strike. So this time I should be fishing with a nice big loop away from the water to allow that fish time to get hold of the fly and pull the line away from me. Let's see if we can get one without it breaking my line this time. As fishermen, we've got this sixth sense. On this particular cast, I don't have that sense. So I'm gonna bring this one in rather quick and cast it out and feel lucky on my next one. Let's see if that sense is there. It feels good, it feels good. Okay, nice big loop to the fly line. Again, I'm watching the end of that tip of that line, because that fish can take two or three foot of line before you, you feel contact with this line in your left hand. So always keep an eagle eye on the edge of that fly line. Watch it move a slightest inch, lift into that fish. Is it going to move? It feels good, it does feel right. Come on fish, play the game. Again, I'm using is a nice, very slow figure of eight. 
Again, the reason for this is it's, it's a natural nymph we're fishing, and natural nymphs cannot swim fast against currents in the water. So you've got to be as limited as possible in these very, very small lakes. So a real slow figure of eight, just creating that figure of eight in your hand. But again, keep your eyes glued to that tip of that fly line. Watch it for any movement in the opposite di direction you're pulling it against. Nice and slow. Now and again, just do a little jerk. If there's a trout following it, that sudden movement entices the trout to get hold of it. It's like a kitten and, kitten and mouse game. That, that mouse stops still and the kitten sits and pauses and waits for it. As soon as that mouse starts to move again, that cat claws that poor little mouse. And exactly the same happens with this trout. It's a game, us versus them. And it's to find who's the smartest. And that cast, it was them fish, unfortunately. Well, there's a nice fish just rose up there. Let's see if we can cover that one. Here we are, tangled around the edge. Okay, that fish has been covered quite well and I'm expecting it might take. When your flies hit the water, they make a, a sudden little plop with the weight of the hook. And often anglers chuck the line out and they'll sit and wait and they'll have a look around, see what's happening. And that's when the line shoots away. The fish has heard that little, that little plop and it's reacted to it to, in, to see what it is. Seeing this lovely little morsel that you're offering it and it's grabbed it and it's pulled it and you've not been ready. As soon as those flies hit the water, you'll get 50% of your takes when nymph fishing, when the fish are high on the surface, within two or three seconds of those flies landing on the water. So a little plop just attracts them towards you. Again, keep that rod tip nice and high, keep your eye on that loop, and watch the end of that fly line. Okay, we've had two or three casts now without a fish, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try and cover a fresh bit of water over there, or try and cast a little bit further into new territory. I've also noticed with the sun coming higher around here now, the fish are beginning to look more into that sun, and that will drive the fish deeper. So what I'll do is I'll chuck it out, and I'll count down 10, 15 seconds, which roughly should be fishing at around about five or six feet. Try that for several casts again. If that doesn't work, I'll try down again about 15, 20 seconds. I'll then be fishing at about 10 feet. This is how you cover your layers through the water till you find those feeding fish. You get a take, you repeat the cast, 15 seconds. You get another take, you repeat the cast, 15 seconds. As I've said that, as the sun, the sun goes behind a piece of cloud, those fish would now come back up in the water. So for this next cast, I'm gonna bring it straight back through the surface, just to see. Healthy cast may produce a fish. Again, watch that line as soon as that flies hit that water. Wait for your take. The fish seem to be a fair way out, so I'm gonna leave this a little bit longer out there just to see, and fish it static. Now the word static means absolutely stationary. A lot of people, when they fish static, they, they, they feel they've gotta keep moving the flies, and that is just not natural for the, for the natural insects to do that. But a nice static nymph just dropping through those layers. It gives the trout time to observe that fly. But as the flies are dropping, if you do a little kick, give the flies a little tweak, that again might just entice that take. Okay, I'm doing something wrong. Something's not happening. I'm expecting a fish several casts again. I've just not had a take. I took two of my first three casts and I've had nothing. So something's changed. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I've just scanned the water. I've noticed the fish have stopped moving in this area here. Maybe they've just drifted across to the right. Or maybe as I say, with the sun coming round, Maybe they've dropped just a little bit deeper. Just as I thought the fish were beginning to change their habits, a fish has grabbed what looks like the hairs here on the top dropper again. This is the second fish to take this fly. It's taking the top dropper very, very close to the surface as the clouds come over. It looks like a good fish and he's coming in quite quickly. Okay, you notice how I've got the rod nice and high. Allow that fish to fight against that, that carbon. A lot of people might put the, the rod too low that you're in direct contact with the fish and this is how, how you get snapped off the fly line with the leader line breaking. This is a very good fish. Okay, I'm going to bring this fish to the net. Notice how I'm in control. I'm, I'm staying in control of that fish. I'm guiding that fish exactly where I want it to go. If I want it to come left, I bring my rod round to the left like that. If I want it near the surface, I'll bring my rod high. I'm keeping that rod a nice big arc so the fish is fighting against that rod, weakening itself as, it, as the fight continues. Okay, he's quite a lively fish, this one. I'll give him a bit of stick just to see how he reacts. He looks a good, a good three pound mark, I'd say. Very, very silver. Okay, notice I'm steering the fish around to where I want him to come, but he ain't having it, bless him. He knows what's coming. A nice big net, yeah, it's a cracking fish. 
Beautiful fish. Okay, keep low. Hey, bad angling, Mr. Bar, bad angling. Okay, he's gone into the reeds. What not to do? Okay, get the fish's head on the surface, roll your rod back over your head and guide him into the net, like so. And here we have another smashing, cracking rainbow trout. Okay, quickly dispatch of the fish. I don't want it to be suffering too long. You hold the fish tight and get a firm crust just right, be right behind the back head, a firm whack. And that fish is now in the land of Nod, permanently. And here we are, you can see it took the hairs ear nymph, hooked in what they call the scissors here. Beautifully hooked, very, very rarely get away when you've got them just in there. And that is a cracking, cracking fish. Okay, let's line him up alongside his, his, his brothers. And see if we can get another one. Lovely brace of trout there for the table. Someone is gonna be very, very happy with those. I certainly know how to catch trout, but please, I have no idea how to cook them. Very, very important when you take up this fly fishing game is, is to think about your days fishing ahead. Plan how you, you plan to catch your trout for the table. Think about what you're doing. Every single cast I'm chucking out, I'm analysing every single cast. Which, fish, which fly did that fish just take? Did it take it early in the retrieve? Did it take it late in the retrieve? Did it take it pulled fast, pulled slow? What angle was the sun at? Every single fish I catch is analysed. If I'm not catching, I'm thinking, why am I catching? Am I fishing too shallow? Am I fishing too deep? Are my flies the wrong colour? Are they the wrong size? Are they going too deep, too shallow? Each little thing has just been questioned in my mind all the time. Maybe it's got something to do with my job, working as a project manager and, a, and an analyst, just constantly analysing data all the time. Fish on again. There we are. Just taking the same one again. That hare's ear really is proven deadly this morning. And again, the reason I put on the hare's ear, there's a bit of thought behind that. When I tied it on, these fish, they, they could be fre fairly fresh to the lake. They've been fed on these brown pellets. And of course, the hare's ear is brown, very emptied of a pellet, a bit sneaky, but again, a thinking angler makes me put on that hare's ear. Okay, I've left my net up the bank. I'm gonna have to carefully play this fish and retrieve my net, let it take some slack line. Here we are with the net. This is a bit of a palava, but it's all part of the fun. Okay, keep that line tight all the time on that fish. Any slack line might allow that hook just to spring away. This occasion seems to have got away with it. The dancing over the line, take up line dancing. This literally is line dancing as you jump over the line like that. Really is the real McCoy. Okay, keep that rod nice and high, allow that fish to fight that carbon. You should always be the winner with this fish. So 8.5 pound line, a two pound fish, a nice seven weight rod, beautiful rod from the Hardy Grays range, the Platinum X, really does it quality rod, it beats the fish very, very quickly. Okay, as soon as that fish gets his head up on the surface, bring that rod high over your shoulder to bring that fish to the net. This is where most fish tend to get lost, is at this final part, skim him to the net, head over, lift. Very, very easy, very effective way to land those fish. Again, another beautiful trout. They're almost like triplets. Identical size, which indicates maybe they are fresh to the lake and why the hair's ear pattern is working. Again, I'm analysing that same bit of data, similar size fish, probably just been put in. And the old hair's ear, the imitative trout pellet, does the business. One's firm smack to the back of his head, dispatch him quickly. Maybe two. And that's another third trout for the table. Thank you.